my invent non-ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness for mind bend creative. When you're taking pictures, what are you looking for? <laughs> um, I am looking for the brief moment where somebody isn't paying attention to themselves. Mm, and do you catch it? I think I'm pretty good at catching it. I, I want that moment where somebody isn't portraying themselves or showing the side of themselves they want photographed, but just that moment where they are just actually a human, mm. which nobody wants people to see them as human. They want to be strong or just have uninterrupted beauty or some ferocity. But actually, I just want authentically that human moment. And so to you, the human moment is very clearly something that's stripped away of a particular artifice or pretension or vibe. Yeah, it's like, um, you know how social media is like, it, it's not real, right? And everybody says like social media is not real, but it's part of the reason it's not real is even somebody who is putting, just wanting to put their life on Instagram, they're not putting the tough parts of their life. Or if they do, they're doing it in their showy way that they have control over, right? It's... Social media is like the control. It's like, this is how I want people to see me. And so bring out a camera, of course, it's gonna be, you know, people will want to show themselves as they want themselves seen. And I don't want to, I'm not out here trying to get somebody's ugly side, which we all have. It's just like that moment where you can't be the character that you want people to see. That It's just you. That's what I want. And, and, and to you, there's value in showing that because it reminds us that there's some shared element of our humanity that, that is, is all uniting and not dividing. Is that too grandiose of a speculation? It's a little grandiose, but um, no, I think it, it's not just for, um, it's, not, it's not just meant to be soothing to people. I think it's just, and it's not just about connecting everybody. It's about connecting specifically the person to the photo, right? I want is I don't want everybody to look at my photos and love them. I mm. think when you're making art, if a, a friend of mine who's a very spicy artist, <laughs> um, I had my first photo show recently, and I was nervous. Thank you so much. I was really nervous about it, and he was like, "Well, if half the room loves it and half the room hates it, you've done well." Was the hate integral to making an impact? It's not. I don't make things hoping people will hate it. I just make things that um, I think have, I think are personal to me and are also maybe have a statement, maybe don't have a statement. Maybe the statement is just like, look how authentically human this person is. Look at this moment where all you can see is that there's a person that used to be a child, a person that has fear and security and also confidence and beauty and strength and... Um, some mix of all of that and I don't want to catch any person's like it's not usually about one emotion it's just like look how human this person is mm -hmm. what do you think of when you think of non-ordinary states of consciousness what comes to mind for you non-ordinary states of consciousness uh I think of psychedelics do you is that one of the first things that comes to mind yeah I think um is is that not what psychedelics are there to do, right? They take you to a different state of consciousness. Uh, I think that they can be evoked through psychedelics and also other practices. So I didn't know if anything came to mind for you when thinking of that term, but the first thing that comes to mind for you is psychedelics. I think so, yeah. yeah. I think of uh, I think of ketamine, if I'm being honest. Okay, and you have personal experience with ketamine? Uh, I, I one time microdosed ketamine I hope that's not too incriminating, but um, I I did, and I it was really interesting uh, the way that it pulls away the ego, which also kind of reminds kind of similar to what I try to do with photography. Mm. Um, it's that moment where you're not watching yourself, mm -hmm. where you're not watching what you're showing of yourself. Um, I don't want to capture what people are trying to show me. I want to capture just what's there. Mm -hmm. Actually, that voice that's deciding what you want to show. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, yeah, ketamine was an interesting one because it pulls away. I was only microdosing. What did microdosing ketamine consist of? How, how was that administered? Uh, I meditated with a friend of mine who orchestrates journeys and... Using ketamine primarily? No, he does like... He, do, he calls them like heart journeys and he does, I've never done one of these with him, so I can't, I'll butcher this, but it's, I think he does a combination of like MDMA and something else. Mm -hmm. um, but he also had a lot of experience with ketamine. And so we did, I microdosed uh, it in powder form okay. and put it in my lip. Um, I did a very, very, very small amount, but it's, I, I'm a, baby like it does not take much for this lady to get high <laughs> same, same with alcohol and and pot no and other things. no alcohol oh. um i can i can drink an obscene amount of vodka like lucille bluth if you know that reference like i if lives were depending on it set up brianna to take the shots she can do them um but uh, yeah, I think people, different people can have different tolerances for different substances. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how or why, it's, but it doesn't seem like it's all based. I think I'm just like hypersensitive to feeling any effect on my brain. And I'm honestly a nervous person when it comes to um, like alcohol is different because you slowly get to it. Slowly get to? To like a, an, an altered state. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it takes a lot. Kind of when you think about the sheer volume of alcohol you drink, if you're drinking wine, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to take that volume of like weed, uh -huh. <laughs> like <laughs> and drink it, and drink it, you'd be fucking. <laughs> uh -huh. You would no longer be human in this mm -hmm, state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so I think that's why people are often so much more comfortable with alcohol. Is you're not signing like you don't take a sip of wine and sign on for four hours of altered state. You know, mm -hmm. so people feel a little bit more control. It's all about control, I think. And I okay. think um, I also, to be transparent, can't do psychedelics anymore. Yeah. I had a brief moment where I could. And I that was when I tried ketamine was kind of like on the outskirts of when I was able to. But I, mm. I was able to try uh, magic mushrooms for a while there mm -hmm. uh, when I when my parents died. Mm -hmm. So grief, I think what it is is that it. I had no control over anything and I was mm -hmm. able to submit to anything because I, grief is, the rug's been pulled out from underneath you. Yeah. Um, I was in the most broken place and just ex trying to accept what just happened when mm. I, when you don't even know, you know, it's like falling into a pitch black lake. Mm -hmm. You don't know which way's up and you're just trying to find air. I was going to be wary of retreading this territory with you because I know you've shared significant amount about this in the past, but if you're comfortable with it, maybe mm -hmm. for this audience, you could share a little bit about how you came to create your podcast, the circumstances that led up to that and, and how that's affected you, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, I am pretty much an open book about grief. Uh, my, in June, 2018, my father just didn't wake up. And then four months later, my mother her body just shut down. She'd been fighting um, a chronic autoimmune disease and her body just shut down. Um, and so she died four months later. And then I became a single mother, went through a divorce uh, that, that started that December without getting too much into the hows and whys of that. Um, which I'm no, I mean, we now co-parent, but for a very long time there, for about three years, three and a half years, I did it almost completely by myself, almost. Mm -hmm. um, so that 2018 was a really massive, traumatic year. You know, uh, I, I think often about, or like look back at photos of like January, February, March, 2018, just having this girl who, as this little baby, um, I was only, you know, 27 turning 28 and just had no idea what was about to happen. And it was 
a real kick in the cunt. Let me tell you what. <laughs> um, so that was wild. And that first year for anybody dealing with just one grief, there the first year is just kind of accepting that it's happened. And I had three big traumas to try and process. So in that year, I mean, I was, I don't even recognize who I was in that year. And I have so much compassion for myself in that time trying to like take my daughter to school. And some days I would just take her to school and then park around the corner and just cry because I'm trying to not just sob in front of my mm -hmm. girl all morning. But I just like, you know, and it was like, I want to talk to my dad about what my husband just did to me. I want to talk to my best friend, my husband, about how much I miss my parents. And it was just this, like, it was the most lonely. I was just, rever I just w was like the little girl again that just wanted her mommy and daddy. I was, it was so fucking hard. And uh, in that time was when... You know, I would have a sitter for, my daughter's name is Amelia. I would have a sitter or she would um, like spend the weekend with my sister. And I remember the first time I tried shrooms, I like went out to Joshua Tree with um, just a group of friends. And I wasn't, I don't even, it's wild to me honestly knowing who I am that I even tried it because I'm kind of a goody two shoes. <laughs> <laughs> like it really did take like the death of my parents for me to be like, fuck it. Yeah, let's okay, do it. No, no moment before that was ever like, it's time for me to experiment with something like this. There, there was never any like inclination no. to be like, I've got the whole weekend free and I've got a friend no. who I know does it and nothing. So you were purposely a goody two shoes because you, that didn't resonate with you for some reason or you, you yeah. love responsibility. You didn't want to let go. You're too controlling. What, what do you think it was? I think all of that. Uh -huh. I think I think I'd always been that kid that like was terrified of not feeling a sense of control, um, and I I mean I did I couldn't even smoke weed. Like I really I, I as I've already stated I could drink, but I didn't even drink that much. I just I think I was apprehensive about like oh man once you do it you're locked in. <laughs> Once you do it, you're locked in. You're, locked you're forever in. changed or you're locked into that moment? No, you're locked into that moment. Okay. And that was like, which if I were to do shrooms now, today, that would be like, I, I would so get into my head about that. I like would, like in the movie, you can get up and go to the bathroom if you want to, but you can't get up, go to the bathroom. You can't from this go to movie. the bathroom oh. from the movie. You yeah. are like, you know, with something like shrooms, it's like this four hours of your life. Uh huh. You're in. Well, how were your peers talking? Did, did, did the did the degrief Brianna committee get together and fire up the van and march you out to Joshua Tree for this? No, it was a bunch of, of couples, and I was seeing somebody at the time, and he um, didn't drink and was like, "I only do shrooms, and it feels great." And his parents were dead as well, and it wasn't even from the angle of like, "This is gonna be like the journey that gets you through grief." This is gonna. It was there was no like medicine man. There was no therapist no that was like helping me. None. Uh -huh. It was like he. It was just for. It was purely for the purpose of, just like let's see if you like it. We'll take a very small amount. I'll help you through it. And just, I think that was the most helpful thing was having somebody who, knew knows what it's like, has done it a bunch, and was like try just this little bit, and then in this amount of time, if you feel good, you can do a little bit more. Like being able to ease into it and mm -hmm. not just like cannonball <laughs> into the deep end yeah. also made a very big difference in terms of like even beginning to approach psychedelics. And you obviously way. trusted your partner at the time. Hugely. Yeah. Still would now. Mm -hmm. Like we're uh, haven't been seen. I mean, we broke up in 2019, but if he was, I would trust him with it today. That's like, great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was an incredible evening. Like everybody, did it and uh it's not like it that wasn't an experience that fully you know it didn't remove my grief i was still very much in the first year but it was a night where i was able to just like feel joy mm. without shame without um 
without like being brought back down to grief, you know, a lot of grief, especially in that first year, you have these moments, I think it's mostly the first three months. It's kind of like a really, your first really big breakup, Mm -hmm. you know, where you wake up and there's that brief moment where you forgot that your parents are dead. And I was having that a lot. And even just like having drinks, I could be having a totally fun night. And then I have to go to the bathroom because I'm, I remember. And I got, Shrooms gave me an evening where I just was able to be so present without being the girl whose dad died. Tell, and mom. T- tell, tell me about and tell us about how that presence to you was embodied. What did you experience corporeally? What was in your body? What was in your mind? What, what, why was this so profound? It is one of, one of the hardest things about that first year is like feeling like you can't fucking escape it. And I feel the same way about the divorce, my parents dying, all of those things put together. But any one of those things, it's like, fuck, I want five minutes of not being in this grief. I want like just a few hours just to be able to go out and connect with people and not be reminded. And like, there, it's, it's kind of this like, I think there are moments in our lives and moments in like moving on from a trauma where... It's so important to be able to escape it a little bit. And escapism can obviously go way too far, Mm -hmm. but fuck, just an evening. (laughs) Like, just let me be my human self, like my, let me be myself and it not be tied to this grief. And that night I feel like I was able to just like purely feel, like be present in this moment and that, helped me tremendously because there's moments in grief where you don't know if you'll ever be able to do that again. Like there's, it's, it follows you everywhere. It's this cloud above your head. And the first year I always use like the cloud above the head is always the, um, imagery, I guess that I use. Um, people like different things. They like the, the rock in the water and there's ripples. I don't know if you've heard this, but there's the, like, you throw a rock in the water and like it ripples at first, but the ripples slowly spread. No, mm. <laughs> I hate that one. Mm-hmm. There's a cloud above your head and the first year it is a shit storm. Mm. Just every day is pouring rain. And then you get like maybe a moment of a little bit of sun, but then straight up pouring rain. The good memories hurt, the bad memories hurt what you're going through, what you're feeling now, the funeral, it all fucking hurts. You're not at the point yet where you can think about something loving and smile and know that you're where you belong and they're where they belong. And you can't in that first year, every good memory is painful. Mm. And I think I need, it was really helpful for me to know that I still was a person aside from that trauma. A night of binge drinking would not have enabled you to feel that way or see that? No. Because you would have become something other than you. You would have become inebriated Brianna. Yeah, and that's not like you... Everybody has been like heartbroken and had a bunch of alcohol the more alcohol you have, the more it leads you to being like, now you're just drunk and sad. <laughs> like, It's the ultimate irony. Everybody drinks away their, their sorrows, right? I mean, a lot of people are prone to doing that. It's yeah. sort of expected, and um, we kind of encourage it with one another. Let's go out for a beer. I know you're feeling bad or whatever, right? Yeah. And I guess maybe at a certain point, there's something to that. It's not the glass of wine with dinner, but the way yeah. that alcohol is set up is it kind of begs for more. I mean, at least in my experience as an alcoholic. But (laughs) for you, uh, shrooms weren't that way because you took the little and you started to feel, you didn't feel like you needed to eat five ounces. Well, I think also like drinking, I think if you can drink and it be about the experience and then like if you are drinking as a way of processing or to avoid thinking about something that's when it can be like uh the perfect storm right Mm -hmm. you can't really drink to forget and that's always the thing that people want to try and do Mm -hmm. they want to drink away their sorrows 
they want to go get drunk and not think about the way that they're feeling, which never fucking happens. If you're like, man, I have been in a what what's the word what's what's the i've, I've been in like Sinkhole, a uh, uh yeah vortex, or just uh, like i've rut a, a rut or i've just been in like my little like depression cave and i just need a night of like having some wine with my best girlfriends like that's about the company that's about connection so if okay, you can drink yeah. in a way that's about connection and about celebration uh, like using that to get out of like a what I, what's the word i want to use a rut or whatever state Mm, yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah, that ain't it. Hobbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, out of your hobbit hole. Um, I, yeah, I think that would be the line in the sand, a line in the sand in terms of like where drinking um, your feelings away. You know, I don't think that drinking, I don't think that alcohol is the worst thing on the planet. It's just how you use it. Well, you right? weren't mushrooming your feelings away. You no. were mushrooming back to Brianna without the sense of pervasive, relentless grief. Yeah, it was just about, I didn't know that that's what it was going to do for me. You didn't I had no that. idea. Yeah. It was just about the entire weekend was kind of about connection. Mm -hmm. And I needed connection to combat my grief. Mm -hmm. I needed to be around people that like, but I think when you do that with a lot of alcohol, um, it doesn't allow you to like leave your grief behind for a moment, really. And also if you're just looking, it's the same thing with like heartbreak. You go through a breakup and you're mm -hmm. just looking for connection anywhere to fill that like gaping hole in your mm -hmm. chest. You're not gonna find it, mm -hmm. you're not. And the people who wanna do that with you are like certainly not the people who are gonna fill that hole. How did your life change after that night? After that experience, what changed? Did you begin to evangelize for the miraculous properties of mushrooms for people who are enduring grief from loss? Um, I think I, all it really did, and again, I've never done psychedelics with a therapist, so I, I, I didn't do that, um, and I didn't try other drugs like that. I just felt like, oh, this is a nice tool in the toolbox. This is a nice, you know, if I feel like I want connection and like a, a light experience, um, and it has to be in the right environment. You have mm -hmm. to be around people that you trust, that you feel emotionally safe with. That I think is a night and day difference when you're trying psil psilocybin, is that what it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, for me, that was a night and day difference because um, I also have had a bad trip. And I think that the biggest part of it being, the biggest issue with it was not feeling like I was around people that I felt emotionally safe with. And I know some people that can just do shrooms willy-nilly like and watch a movie or go to sleep. Yeah. But yeah. I think for anybody that's, that um, has a personal need for safety, uh -huh. I think that can be the make or break of doing shrooms is like the environment and the people that you're with. Um, so yeah, I think it was, it became this sort of like, wow, look at this beautiful thing that I can do to connect with people and be present. It allows me to be present and joyous. You feel so happy, not like stupid happy, not like, you know, the 15 year old pothead at your high school. The giggles. Yeah, not like the giggles, but just like true, joy with people you love mm -hmm. um, is it can be an incredible thing um, if you're able to be around people you feel safe with and also let go a little bit but you have to also say to yourself like I'm choosing to let go so I do have control I'm choosing to do this it's not I'm not like being forced into it um, so that yeah that was the way that it was like it was helpful for me moving forward through that year well mushrooms are of the moment right now right there seems to be um uh more and more visibility for mm -hmm. an awareness of the power of psilocybin mushrooms where are you seeing it come up what are you familiar with with regards to how the landscape is changing where where are peers talking about it when are, are you are you seeing it in popular culture or art or in your community or friends? Has it, has it grown since that time? Did oh, it open gosh. your eyes? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I've seen um, most of the parents at my daughter's school all do shrooms. And in a microdosing capacity? Some, some microdose and some, like, man, every... My daughter went to a school that was, like, very 
known for having a lot of um, rich parents, rich parents and parties and things. And I just noticed that like every parent there was like down with shrooms. And I was like, wow, school has changed since my yeah. day. Yeah. Um, but although I was a kid, maybe I didn't know. And all the parents that back then were also doing stuff too. I think the something that I've noticed in terms of the conversation around psychedelics in LA is I noticed too many people suggesting it as a replacement for doing the work. And I know people. What's the work, Brianna? The work is like. A quick fix, in other words, is that what you're saying? I, th I don't think that they mean it to be a quick fix, but I think that there's a lot of people that want to just skip over the work of like, me, you know, doing your inner child work, going to seeing a therapist for a while, not like do a session, but like, be mi like mindfulness and connecting with yourself, connecting with your body. You don't need psychedelics to do any of that work. And it's really good, important work. And facing trauma, a lot of people want their trauma to just be gone. And I get it because I've been through most of the awful things that a person can go through. You know, most, a lot, a lot. I had a fucked up childhood. I was abandoned and then adopted. I was abused. I... Uh, just believe me when I say I went through hell. And as an adult, when I've had to confront trauma, sometimes I'm just fucking exhausted. I'm like, God, can't I have one year? Like, it is exhausting. And also to feel like maybe in some, some of the circumstances make you feel like a victim. It's stuff that nobody wants to go into. It's hard fucking work. But taking psychedelics is not going to fix it it's not it's not a, a you know it's 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 not like a fix-all method of dealing with trauma you have to do the work I feel like I see so many people I, I I dated somebody who when he found out about some of the things that I've gone through in my life and my parents and things I mean that's not a secret it's literally on the I have a podcast about it but you know, his response to that always was just, you really need to do a journey. You really need uh. to try. Let me connect you with my, my, and I'm like, no amount of MDMA is going to bring my parents back. It's just not. And I think that it can be absolutely instrumental in some people's processes, but it's okay that it doesn't work for everybody. And even if I did it and it was amazing, still got to do the work, still I still have to go through the grief. It's not something you can go around. Um, so that would be the one thing, the toxic thing that I've noticed in LA with psychedelics is like people aren't using them just for, it's amazing that people use them for therapy, but it's not a replacement for long-term work. And I think people want it to be. Where where do we get the long term work? What what helps with the long term work? What facilitates the long term work? Are we talking okay. about finding a psychologist that you work with on a regular basis? It can or? it might it might be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. It could be um, a therapist. Um, it could be um, I I I used to see a sexual therapist just to connect me with my body because of the way that I my certain survival mechanisms caused me to shut down physically from myself. And I needed to con con reconnect myself. Mm. Having a therapist and also just like read, even if you're like, you don't have, you're not in the headspace for therapy, like mindfulness and reading. And I also like found Buddhism and I um, started doing work on like the suffering that I bring to myself and it not being, and like giving a g the gift to myself of like not exposing myself to suffering as a way of challenging myself does that that is a strength and um this is all work that anybody can be doing and you just whether or not you're doing the psychedelic therapies i just that long-term work of of wanting to do better be better find balance um and be mindful is a kindness that you can give yourself and everybody around you to be honest um, and I, I guess just for me, the thing that I always go back to when anybody is like, you know, so hung up on how healing and fixing psychedelics are, I'm like, not without that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you gotta be doing all of the other stuff too. And yeah, it can look different for different people. There's so many different types of therapy, but none of them 
fix a problem in a day, mm -hmm. not one, mm -hmm. because it takes rewiring yourself. For me, in a lot of ways, it was letting go of survival mechanisms that no longer serve me. Okay. Yeah. And you needed, you needed a helping hand to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, and also just needed to do, even with a therapist, you're doing the work yourself. Mm -hmm. Like a therapist can't fix everything for you. You can't get in there and rewire it all for you. Yeah. You have, you have that power and you have to like, and also just being a person that signs off on your own actions. Like I pride myself on being a person that signs off on my own actions. I see a lot of people struggle with that and I have friends that struggle with that. And I think you have to have a certain presence of mind to be able to do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. But that requires being comfortable with yourself to allow that presence, right? True. And I am obnoxiously comfortable with myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> but that's that's a serious hurdle for a lot of people, for real, right? Yeah. 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 It's tough work to do because I think a lot of people are afraid that doing this work on yourself is going to open a can of worms that they think is tucked in so nicely. There was a time when I felt that way. I didn't grow up in a family where, mm. or, or a town where therapy was encouraged. I didn't know anybody with a therapist. Like I come from the wrong side of the train tracks and that was just not something that was ever discussed or supported. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, you know, tough fucking La Puente Brianna had a boyfriend that was like, I think we should try therapy. I was like, pfft. Pussy. Like I, was like, <laughs> I was like 20 years old, maybe if that. Um, and then I started doing it and I even then like couldn't take it seriously. 100% thought I was smarter than the therapist. Mm. Um, but well, you know, your th you know yourself better than your therapist does. Yeah. Yeah. As you should, uh -huh. as we all, as we yeah. all should. So you're off, you yeah. get off on an interesting foot to begin with in that dynamic. Yeah. So just me feeling like she said something that was like the wrong pitch or like the, mm. the, the a bad read mm. I was like where did you get that yeah. like I just was yeah. what a little shit right. <laughs> just 20 year old little asshole um but I mean I am so so glad that I did that work and something about my when, so when my, when my mother died when my mother passed the day of her funeral I stood up there and I just buried, also, I buried like my whole family. My parents were like the last of the people to die. Everybody went in like two years. And my mother was like the matriarch, the sent the totem pole of the family. Did you lose siblings as well? I didn't lose siblings, but I only had one that I was adopted with. Mm -hmm. um, so she was there as well, but I... We, we don't even have time to go into it, sure. but I was, you know, I was like that person that was like the person that everybody kind of went to, to figure things out. I, mm -hmm. I became, I was the next in line totem. Okay. And, uh, I just remember standing up there looking at everybody that was there and I'm now the next of kin and everybody here just ex expects me to be strong in a way that I haven't seen them with other the other funerals I I looked up there my husband didn't come and I just said what was the point of all of this strength I was raised to be the strongest person in every room why when all I really want is one person here to be really worried about And that was a survival mechanism that I'd been carrying with me, something that I was raised to do, something I'm very capable of. I do very well in chaos. But why? Look at all of like the love that I've rejected or been unable to feel safe with because of the need to be strong. And so that day was the first day, I think since I was about three years old, that I felt like a little girl wearing my mother's shoes. And there was something really transformative about that. And I had a very, very transformative next year between the grief, processing all of that, and just truly taking this armor off. And it takes work. It's not like I'm still like 
My therapist likes to refer to it as Brianna's inner gangster. I've got the gangster that will, you know, I've got a kid, so it'll come out, but. Your littlest IG. My what? Your littlest internal gangster. Ah, yes, my littlest internal gangster. Um, yeah, I think I, I gave my permit myself permission to be soft Mm. and also then just got so deep into what like divine femininity looks like and celebration of, of my own gender, other genders, um, and what wounded gender looks like. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been absolutely transformative few years for me. Um, and then funny enough, I went into 2020, like, wow, this is going to be my year. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. 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 Well, uh, you, the rough stuff was all out of the way. Yeah. Truly though. It, I mean. You launched a podcast. I did. To air some of your thoughts potentially and mm-hmm. to facilitate a conversation about grief. Yes. Um, that podcast, you're no longer producing it came to a conclusion oh did it come to a conclusion i mean i think there will ultimately be more episodes Mm -hmm. um the pandemic was one of the things that halted it Mm -hmm. because i really needed it to be in person you know you're talking to somebody else about grief it's like it's such a personal and sometimes painful thing and it just for me needed to be in person because i'm also all about connection and Mm -hmm. feeling and I think that was so essential to what I was doing and I started it because I was on the phone with um my friend Michael Runyon who was on my podcast he was the first person that came in and it was the first time that I felt any sense of relief and his dad's dead and um I'd always known that his dad was dead but I never was able to see his grief until we connected about mine. And then I just went, you've had this cloud the whole time? Like the cloud, the the cloud above your head, you've had this as long, I'd known him since I was 17, I think. And I just didn't know. And then I was like, and then it, I talked to more and more people with dead parents and it was like, oh my gosh, like this is one of the only thing that makes me feel any sense of relief is that other people understand what this is like. Mm -hmm. And that was why I started the podcast. Um, And it was a great, I, I, it was a year where all I could think about was grief though. And then I think when I wasn't able to do it anymore, when I needed a break, it, the world gave it to me in the form of a pandemic, which is a bit much, but. (laughs) (laughs) Quite a diversion. Quite a diversion. But I also really needed it, to be honest, um, because I needed my life to not be about Like I needed my every day to no longer be about that trauma. Um, I needed that in order to That's what I was wondering. I figured that that, that in in a way it's kind of like sometimes I feel about therapy, especially when you have to find a new therapist, if you do feel find a new therapist, rehashing old injuries and reconjuring moments and Mm -hmm. treading, retreading dicey territory. Um, so I wondered about that for you. I wondered what it was like to continually be abiding in that space. And if in the conclusion which the pandemic provided, mm-hmm. uh, uh, maybe that was part of it. Mean, you're not immediately intent upon firing it up again necessarily to to um, to get back into that headspace, which is partly why I didn't want to have to drag you through too much of that No, no, it's today. fine. I'm, I am happy to talk about it. And um, and I, I think I will record a couple more episodes. I've things are definitely different for me in terms of like where I'm at with mm-hmm. um, my dead parents, not the podcast because it's called my dead parents, but I, I mean my dead parents. Uh, I am, you know, my grief is in a very different place, still sometimes aches like hell. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the anniversary of my mother's death is in a week. I've started to feel it a little bit, but you know, in the second year you start to like map your grief. So the first year, chaos, just fuck it. It's, like I said, shitstorm every single day. Mm-hmm. Second year, you start to like have. Oh, I'm so sorry. Second year, you start to actually n- get some sense of like when the the hole you get. You're when you're about to like go into a bit of a grief hole, mm-hmm. 
and how to communicate with the people you love about it. And um, so if I, you know, if I came back and I do feel like I owe my listeners a little bit more conclusion. And I think part, if I, if I did do more episodes, it would be in part because um, I do have people still reach out to me and ask for more. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask about that. Cause you know, you're, you're broaching this topic and um, you're, you're providing this window into a space that a lot of the people like you are interested in. So can you, can you tell me like what it was like to get feedback and interaction from people who, to whom the podcast mattered? I mean, were you able to get that sense from, from an audience? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think because it's one of those things that like people want to connect on so desperately because you feel so alone. Um, and you can't always talk to your family about it, or maybe you don't have family to talk to about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I getting messages about it truly like changing uh, things for people. I'm not going to say it like saved anybody's life, but I think it, might have helped some people's lives a little bit. Yeah. And that is what I, it one, what a weight. <laughs> like, you know, but also, yeah, it made every second of it so worth it. All the hard work that went into that first season. And um I was so, so grateful to read emails and messages from people. I had like it has its own email account and there were but there were moments where I couldn't even respond to stuff um, because it was just too much. I was still so much in my own grief. Mm -hmm. How do I start talking to other people about theirs? Yeah, you're I'm not a counselor a just because you're yeah. uh, talking about the topic. But I wanted to so badly be able to. I'm such mm -hmm. um, an emotional person. I'm all everything for me is emotion. And um, I wanted to be able to connect with people and be there for people. And I tried to. But you miss people. Like you can't get everyone. Um, uh, but no, it was honestly incredible. I, I read everything. I read every comment or every message and it's just like, oh, the fact that like the pain I'm going through, it gives purpose to the pain I'm going through in a small way that like if other people can connect to this and feel comforted by the fact that other people are feeling the same things. It's amazing how similar grief is. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's different for everybody as with all forms of trauma, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it be, abandonment, your parents dying, a breakup, a serious illness, whatever it is, you can have, connect with other people who have experienced everybody's individual experience, of course, is unique. Mm -hmm. But talking to other people who like have felt this specific ache mm -hmm. is so healing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. I could talk to you about this a lot longer, but our time is drawing to a close. Grief comes when people die. It comes in a lot of, Forms. It can come from sexual assault. It can come from being fired. It can come from breaking up with a friend or a lover. But we associate grief a lot with death, I think, as human beings. And one of my pie in the sky dreams is that as we evolve over time, we begin to frame the experience, the phenomenon of death differently. Um, it, would, it would feel good to me if we could celebrate death somehow, um, although that would seem to mandate a kind of uniform belief that everybody's on the same page about what happens when we go and why we were here to begin with, right? So that's a, that's a, that's a pretty wild array of opinions there. I was raised with a lot of religion, and the idea is basically when you die, you go to heaven, and heaven is a place where you see everybody you love and miss. You know, that's kind of the first level of comforting feeling that comes from talking about death and why we cry at funerals and why we why we feel sick and we miss. I mean, I'm missing someone is different compared to like speculating as to what's actually happening with them now. In your process, in your background, in your imagination, in your spirituality, have you have you come to any solid or not so solid conclusion as to what you think's happens when when we die or where we go um <clears throat> i was always on the fence i was open to all possibilities but not married to any of them when my mother died i it was just the two of us seems like that's how it always should have been and i held her head 
when I knew her last breaths were coming and her eyes were open and I looked at her and I said, you're doing great. And I told her to tell my father I said hi and I just helped her die. And then when I saw the light go out and I saw her pupils expand, I had this, the first thing that came to my head was, is there nothing? You just don't exist anymore. And I would love for that to not be true. I've had a lot of my own struggles with that. Um, what happens when we die? Um, and most recently had my own health battles that have made me had have to cons think about my mortality and do some planning. I don't know. I don't know what I believe. I believe that. I believe that there. It's possible that the God on Earth is love, and I think. It, and I know that when I go, the people I leave behind will miss me. And that's all I know. Thanks for taking time to come and speak to me today, Brianna. Thank you. And thanks for sharing your story and your experience with others. I think part of what the aspiration here with this podcast too is to help create open, safe containers for dialogue um, for people to be able to express themselves, to ask questions, um, and and specifically to um, to think about what it means to pursue wellness and wholeness and to have a good and skillful life for yourself and for those that you care about. Um, so I, I appreciate your work and your effort and, uh, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure.